Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Tutun Mukherjee from University of Hyderabad. We shall continue our discussion on post colonialism. The other module, module number 1, spoke about post colonial theory, and in that module, we explored some definitions. Uh, of post colonialism and certain associated terms that come into currency when we talk about post colonialism. Today, we are going to extend our discussion and explore the relationship of certain concepts which figure very importantly in our understanding of post colonialism. The first such concept is that of the nation. You will know that nation as an idea came into a discourse in uh, the late uh, 18th through the 18th and the 19th centuries in Europe, and post colonial studies have in fact renewed this discourse on uh, the idea of the nation and uh, the meaning of nationalism. In Europe, uh, the theories of nation gave currency to the thought that nation is the only legitimate political and social form. And the ultimate aim of this uh, theorization of nation, this discourse on nation, this body of literature was to uh, propose a certain kind of loyalty to the nation state among the citizens. This had followed the change in Europe from its earlier political structure of feudalism into the formation of new republics and new nations. So, there were a lot of discussion going on. Contemporary writers who belong to post colonial discourse like Ben Okri, Salman Rushdie, Bharati Mukherjee, Jamaica Kincaid, Rohinton Mystery and so many others who are generally regarded as writers of post colonial condition, deal with the nation and nationalism, elaborate certain discussions and try to create a kind of awareness about the different dimensions of this discourse. A uh, recent scholarship uh, on nation suggests a more abstract notion of the nation as a kind of a cultural and a social context and a symbolic rather than a natural essence as a nation should be understood. In the post colonial context, we can make two broad generalizations, that of the colonizers or the western powers, which had extended its control over territories in the rest of the world and the colonized people, which is regarded as the rest of the world. So, there is this kind of a binary division between the west and the rest. Resistance is therefore, a key term to define the new nations that came into being after the passing of colonial control. So, resistance is the identifying quality of one's own community that is resisting against the domination by foreign power or even threats of domination. In the context of globalization today, for instance, resistance could also be seen as an identification with one's own culture, one's own ethnicity, one's own identity uh, against a sort of universalization, a sort of uh, you know glossing over as global culture. And thus, 
there is a suggestion of, uh, uh, of an existing conflict between an essential understanding of a globalized world as uh, that will efface distinctions and differences and the desire to hold on to one's own specific cultural, social, ethnic identity. The term national culture is also very uh, problematic for a country like India, we ha where we have many cultures, we have many languages, we have different kinds of social practices, we have different kinds of social cultural communities. So, how can we pull all these differences together, efface diversities and impose a national culture upon ourselves? This is very difficult. In So, nation as an idea when we talk in terms of the Indian context is a complex idea and ha one has to be very careful in understanding the way this works, that we are a nation despite our diversities, despite our differences. So, how do we put it together uh, in an understanding is offered by a theorist Arjun Appadurai. He suggests and I will quote, we need to think ourselves beyond a nation. The role of intellectual practices is to identify the current crisis of the nation as a concept, he says, and in identifying it to provide part of the apparatus of recognition for post national social reforms. So, what uh, Appadurai is actually suggesting by going beyond the nation is to become a citizen of the world, <coughs> participate in the nation, at the same time participate in the globe. So, what he is therefore suggesting is to become a participant in a world of hybridity. We have discussed this word in our earlier module. So, this is the emergence of a hybrid culture in the world that exists today. No culture is now pure as such, originary as such. So, it is a hybrid world and Appadurai says that we must now participate in the nation as well as participate in the world and in terms of globalization as an economic process. He says, this should enable us to use and reuse products of globalization all around the world. Now, this is very briefly the concept of the nation. You should read a very important book that talks about uh, the formation of a nation by Benedict Anderson, imagining a nation, how an idea of a nation is imagined as community of people coming together. So, after a brief idea about uh, nation as it uh, works in post colonialism, we shall move to examine another word which is also very important today and this word is race and uh, in connection with it racism. Race is believed to be a concept that differentiates groups of people on the basis of it, but it is argued in post colonial theorization that racism which is a form of ideology, which is a form of a social practice is a product of colonialism, which creates difference between people. It is directly connected racism, race people belong to different races, but when it becomes converts translates into racism, it becomes dangerous, because then it becomes a way of differentiating people and being directly connected 
to the access to power. The popular concept is that of difference between people of the white race and those of darker races. This has clearly created a classification difference between races. The white races of fair skin, skin color considered superior to the darker races of darker skin color considered inferior. Not only in terms of skin color, but this idea penetrates into intellectual and mental capacity also and then this becomes very insidious, very dangerous, something to be alert to. The Europeans feared that Asians and the black purse people would assault them. There was during colonization a fear of sexual assault and this fear created a bigger difference, a bigger gap between races. So, how does racism form the basis of colonial discrimination? This question is addressed to some extent by Todorov, a Russian theorist who explains the word racism in two ways. He says, number one, racism is a behavior of hatred or contempt for individuals who have certain defined physical characteristics as different from one's own. This he calls racism. Second, he says racism is an ideology as we said before. He says he defines it as a doctrine concerning human races which might produce racialism. Racism is a phenomenon seen worldwide, creating a sense of difference between people. But racialism is different. According to Todorov, it is a movement of ideas that originated in Western Europe during mid 18th century. Todorov makes certain propositions on racialism. He says, the existence of racism can be explained in two ways, scientific and socio-psychological. Secondly, he says the cultural difference of a race, which means a collective or a group, can be seen in all individuals belonging to that particular race. However, racialists can often believe that some races are superior to other races. So, this is a movement of idea, this is racialism, obtaining from the concept of race, which produces certain ideas of how race performs. So, racialism will mean that uh, some races are regarded as superior, while others are regarded as inferior. Todorov holds that the contempt between races is based on their physical differences, which percolates, which is expressed sometimes, articulated sometimes as even emotional and psychological intellectual difference. So, race has been uh, a very um, uh, troublesome, problematic concept, because not because of itself. It, that is a fact that there are people in the world which belong, who belong to different races. But the problem comes when it becomes a factor to create difference among people in terms of racism and in terms of racialism, which means certain ideas getting circulated about differences between races, considering one race superior to another. Uh, uh, and these kinds of uh, kind which, uh, which is expressed in uh, human behavior. If we think racism is over, then we are wrong, because new racism has come into being, has emerged, which is a new kind of an awareness uh, that, uh, that is being created. And uh, you should know 
that uh, this is a kind of a strong bias or a tendency against people of color when there is a kind of profiling on the base of color on the base of race so this is uh, n n something that is prevailing something that has not passed that there there is violence still there is hatred still which is Im embedded in the concept of racism and racialism there is more hidden and uh, difficult varieties of uh, racism uh, which uh, relates to identity of a person one might argue that race is a political issue what has it to do with society and culture so there shouldn't be any problem anymore for example the election of president obama uh, to one of the highest offices in one of the most important countries of the world should have flagged the idea of race having disappeared that was indeed a victory to go beyond to transcend race but it did not lead to the disappearance of racism or racialism so there are people who have uh, who pertain to the thesis of covert racism hidden racism and there is also the concept of symbolic racism these are discussed by a theorist called Snyderman and in the first proposition of covert racialism it he means that the uh, this concept of racism is not displayed and uh, by the meaning of social uh, symbolic racism he means that uh, this is expressed in the way uh, people would uh, express uh, their attitude and their behavior the hypothesis that Stein Snyderman projects is that a single person is the symbol of a race and therefore that person can be so identified these are two ways of new racism which prevails today another philosopher Etienne Balibar he defines new racism as racism without race what he means is that the concept does not merely rely on biological concept of race but it falls back on culture it is true that cultures are hybrid but it does not mean that they are completely flexible and fluid Balibar argues though there are any individual exceptions he admits it is always that one particular cultural group will prefer that particular group will be biased or would have pre, you know predilection for that particular group so they will form different cultural communities and these communities will continue to exist with their own cultural basis and therefore a society will be automatically divided on the basis of race so what has balibar does do what balibar does is to make a change a shift from the concept of race as a biological term and relates it also to the formation of society that pe people belonging to different races will continue to have their own racial communities and therefore race cannot disappear has not disappeared they will remain as separate communities of people belonging to a particular race to sum up then the five central elements of new racism as proposed by theorists are number one the increasingly covert nature of racial discourses and practices because racism is regarded uh, doubtfully by people so discourses of racism have now become more hidden 
more covert. The second point, the avoidance of racial terminology and ever growing claim by whites that they are experiencing reverse racism. So, the whites, white people now claim that there is a kind of reverse racism that they are being targeted as a group of uh, you know by the other non-whites. That is also some theorists say is an aspect of new racism. Third, the invisibility of most mechanisms to reproduce racial inequality. There is these mechanisms are in place, but they are not very clearly visible. Fourth, the incorporation of safe minorities to signify non racialism of policy. So, there is a there is more and more a gesture to accommodate minorities to make policies appear as non racist. And finally, the continuous rearticulation of some racial practices. Racial practices do not disappear, they are not erased or effaced, but they resurface. So, these are the five points that define the existence of new racism in our world even in the 21st century. Now, we move on to yet another concept after having discussed nation and race and racism and racialism, we shall now focus on diaspora. Now, diaspora is a Greek word, the root is a Greek word meaning disperse, disperse of seeds, dispersal of seeds. The Oxford dictionary defines it as people who have spread or dispersed from their homeland. It was initially used in relation to the Jewish people who dispersed away from their homeland and spread around the world. But when the diaspora relocates, they do not forget their homeland. Therefore, very important to the people of the diaspora are memory and questions of identity. These are inevitable. They always memorialize, they always take recourse to memory of the past of their homeland and there is also related to their relocation, you know. Displacement and relocation in a new land, which would also be connected with their understanding of identity. The diasporic people derive from all their resources consciously or unconsciously to construct their identities. Sometimes in the new lands, they have to assimilate and they have to understand their new context and there is always a continual process of structuring and constructing their identities. This helps them in transcending their original boundaries of physical, social and cultural kinds. In effect, therefore, the people of the diaspora need to reconcile, reconcile in the new locations and try to assimilate the physical, social and the cultural, uh, um, cultural components of their new location. The identification of a cultural group or race is uh, not uh, very simple as there is always a dominant force. In, in the land where they have relocated, uh, they encounter very often oppression, exclusion, uh, subjugation, injustice, uh, the operation of power, but they have to compensate for this 
by uh, trying to accommodate all these differences and uh, you know re, re uh, assume their position in the new land. Considering a traditional experience, race produces identity or crisis in identity. So, people when from one race go relocate in another place of a different majority race. So, these, these are some complex issues that have to be encountered uh, to uh, for the relocation in terms of diaspora. Uh, the idea of black nationalism for example, is an issue to be considered. Uh, there was social and political movement as we are aware away from the homeland of the people of uh, or, or, you know original people of Africa of black skin and they came back uh, to their homeland or thought about their homeland with a kind of, uh, of with a kind of uh, a feeling a very strong powerful feeling which later became described as black nationalism. So, there is one poem very beautiful poem by James Weldon Johnson written in the uh, written in the late 19th early 20th century uh, in his poem called a poet to his baby son. Johnson writes my son this is no time nor place for a poet grew up and join the big busy crowd that scrambles for what it thinks it wants out of this old world which is as it is and probably always will be. Take the advice of a father who knows you cannot begin too young not to be a poet. So, this is an appeal of the father to a baby son to be able to grow up not lose the imagination, but try to uh, acculturate and accommodate in a new land. Evidently the speaker, speaker is appealing for integration, assimilation, acculturation, but this also is not totally acceptable by all people because the people in the diaspora do not want to efface the difference entirely. They want to be accepted in the community where they have relocated, yet retain their own uh, community uh, or ethnicity or uh, you know racist or I am sorry race kind of uh, identity formation, they do not want to sacrifice uh, in order to assimilate. Another note that we must remember is identity is not an end product, there is always a kind of evolving that happens, identity is fluid, identity is always a process, it is never complete and identity in that sense can transcend place, time, history and culture in the process of continual transformation. So, this is a very essential part of the communities of the diaspora who settle in different parts of the world. We know people of Indian origin have settled in different parts of the world, they form the Indian diaspora and in their writing, they have written beautiful literature about their experience in their writing what becomes evident is this process of relocation, the difficulties they have faced and different kinds of problems that they have had to encounter and the constant process of structuring their identity that must take place. There are different generations also of settlement diasporic settlements and there is a difference in the experience of different generations in the, in the location they have settled in. So, this has given us a huge body of writing, which is very interesting and very powerful, because that gives different perspectives of people's lives lived in different locations away from their homeland. There is a person called Rogers Brubaker 
who gives a different point about diaspora, diaspora. He argues that there are three main points about dispersion regarding diaspora, the homeland orientation and boundary maintenance. I will repeat, he talks about dispersal, homeland orientation and boundary maintenance and he con confirms that the use of the terms contribute to the loss of discriminating power and involves the risk of being isolated. When he talks about the interconnection between diaspora and memory, he says one might feel very natural, okay. but there are uh, these different senses also which must be acknowledged that uh, there is a certain kind of distance that has happened uh, um, uh, which with the homeland and which might bind the people of the diaspora together. So, it is a personal experience that creates a memory in the person and there is a certain kind of a boundary that is also emerging. Shared memories about a place, people, oral literatures and language create diasporic memory. Clearly, diaspora has its base in memory. But this means that without memory once diasporic identity is erased, does it mean that? It does not mean that because diasporic memory uh, transcends itself, its location and becomes uh, fused with new locations and it transforms all the time. It is modified and invented, so it can be remembered is the process of formation of cultural identity, memories and histories together, fusing together, you know the past and the present fusing together to an imagined unity, imagined there is not a fixed union. So, in this diasporic discourse the issue of home becomes very relevant and uh, a reality and there is always a kind of a return to homeland. In this context, Avtar Bra defines home as a mythic place of desire in the diasporic imagination. It is also the lived experience of a locality. The diasporic people always make evident in their writing their living, their living reality in fusion with their memory. So, uh, this is what becomes a very important part of the post colonial understanding of the writing as well, because uh, many post colonial conditions circumstances had made people move away from their homeland. So, that is the concept of diaspora and literature of the diaspora that becomes very interesting to read and uh, very powerful body. Of, uh, of understanding uh, the post-colonial condition. Finally, we shall discuss uh, the concept of cosmopolitanism, also derived from the Greek rude cosmopolis, cosmos which means the universe and polis which means the city. So, cosmopolitanism is a political and a philosophical concept which puts forward the position that we are all citizens of the world and need not be necessarily understood to be only attached to a nation. Arjun Appadurai, if you go back, if you recollect, talked about this that we participate in the nation and we can participate in the world. So, cosmopolitanism is a kind of a perspective, a kind of an attitude which transcends the boundaries of a culture, of a society, of even a nation and makes us participants in a global culture, in the culture of the world. Therefore, it might seem to pose a challenge to traditional views, uh, which, uh, which we have been talking about that you know we do not want to efface or erase our ethnic or communi communitarian 
or cultural identities. Then where is the kind of a uh, kind of uh, contrast, what is this kind of difference that is there in the understanding. It need not be that you sacrifice one to become attached to another. So, one can be attached to a particular ethnicity, culture, identity, yet make it effort to transcend them to also participate in a global culture, in the culture of the world. There is no dualism here there is no conflict in these ideas. Derrida, Jacques Derrida, a very important theorist, explains this concept in detail and he traces it back to the past Greek philosophers and even to uh, you know, a philosopher of uh, Romanticism, Immanuel Kant, uh, to bring up concepts of democratization and globalization to understand cosmopolitanism. He presents globalization as a paradox. He argues that globalization actually does not take place. He asks if globalization is prevalent between disparities in societies which have different social and economic inequalities. So, Globalization is not a uniform kind of a movement, because it encompasses societies which are not of the same uh, economic stature. So, to think of globalization as a kind of universalization would be foolish. So, there are no equal opportunities, no equal commercial or trade uh, uh, partnerships, there is always inequalities. So, we must understand that in terms of cosmopolitanism also, there is space for uh, people of different uh, um, identities of uh, different denominations to coexist with the rest of the world. He makes another proposition that wherever it is believed globalization is taking place, it should be understood to be taking place for better and for worse. So, there is there are different aspects of globalization. There are some positive aspects and there are some negative aspects and we need not go into detailed discussion of globalization, because there has been much, much debate on that idea. But for our post colonial uh, theorization, it is an important concept, which can be related to the understanding of cosmopolitanism, which means to go beyond these inequalities and uh, 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 you know try to make an effort to share in some of the tendencies and the trends of the world. The main points of cosmopolitanism to remember as proposed by Jacques Derrida are number one, it brings forth a sense of sovereignty of a particular state. It transcends the idea of a state, one singular state or local identity to world state. 3. It is a perspective which could transform ideas of theology, politics, secularity, society, home and identity in a global context. Four, there should necessarily be a balance between the ideas of state as local and state as global. One idea should not stand in opposition to the other. So, this is basically what he means by certain essential qualities of globalization, which should translate to make us into cosmopolitan uh, um, inhabitants of a world of a planet that we all share. Finally, uh, we must understand uh, um, post-colonial studies as offering a method of reading. Now, what we have been talking about are these different concepts, which recur in post-colonial discussions. So, post-colonialism is actually a mode of reading which is different from the way 
texts were read before. So, the, there is a kind of a shift in the position of the reader, the place of reception of these texts and reading these texts from the perspectives of all these new concepts that we have discussed, which are for example, the nation, race, cosmopolitanism, diaspora. So, these are new bodies of literatures that have emerged, new discourses which have emerged, which are talking about writing from a different perspective, from a different location uh, in the reception of these texts. That is what we have been talking about in understanding post-colonial theory. Thank you.